to Cleveland. I was in, my client died. I had a client that was taking care of when they, when he died. The one that I started with in '90 when he died, I was in between clients, and I got a job for apartment complex, working with an apartment complex. Okay. So I lived there in the apartment complex, and I worked there in East Cleveland. In East Cleveland. Which complex was that? The one on Forest Hill and uh, Terrace. The one that's on the right hand side, not the one on the left hand side. The one that is between Forest Hill and um, Superior. They got some they got some doors board. I think a new company took them over. Oh yes, yes, yes. I, I know exactly one. That they have that one, and then there's one across the street. Yeah. And then there's uh, one closer to the shopping center. So right. So sort of the three separate. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you were you were like the uh, manager. the one where they has. I wasn't bad. I was just working. I was. Helping, you know, helping the manager. Okay. Yeah. Cleaning, cleaning the, the hallways, the glasses, and getting the apartments ready for a new attendance. Cleaning the apartments up after tenants left. Taking care of the lawn, you know, helping to do that. You know, I had two other people I was helping. What, what was the approximate year that you first moved here? Uh, that was that was that would probably be in the uh, two thousand six seven. 2008, 2009. Okay. okay. Probably seven, eight, nine, ten. I lived in East Cleveland. Okay. But but prior to that, you have recollection of East Cleveland. Even when you were living in, in Cleveland, there were times you would go to East Cleveland. You knew people from East Cleveland. Yeah, I would I would go to East Cleveland. East Cleveland was like the. Uh, like the ghetto area of, of, of town, you know, it was considered, East Cleveland was considered the worst area, one of the worst areas in town. Okay. As far as a city is concerned. Okay. Cleveland had bad areas, but the whole East Cleveland area was considered bad. If you had a nice house, there was some ni bad houses around next to it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know where where you live in East Cleveland. You was across the street or the street over. You can't find like a whole section of East Cleveland that's real nice. Right today. Yeah. Today, um, can you think back to East Cleveland? Say I used to come to East Cleveland during the sixties, seventies, coming from the rain to party when one hundred and five and Euclid was not Cleveland Clinic, nothing but bars and stuff. You might have been by that. You you would not believe. How many stories we're getting about this 105 uh, Winston? Yeah. I, I mean, they're just filling us in. Go ahead, tell us about that. Yeah, I used to come come up to party. You know, you could leave. Uh, I could leave Lorraine at 2:30 when the bars left mm -hmm. close. Come to 105 in Euclid and party till six, seven o'clock in the morning. Because if you had a basement, you had an after-hour joint. And how did East Cleveland fit in, in, into that? You just drove. Well, East Cleveland was a little bit better then. They didn't have as many abandoned houses because people were living in those houses because there was factories. There was, was, you know, there was money. There was, it was a boom, boom town. Can you tell us about East Cleveland back then? I mean, any, any. Well, back then, you know, you had houses. You had, you had a lot of houses had big, big houses in East Cleveland because this is was where I, this is where Rockefeller sold. At one time, East Cleveland was the, was 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 high society living. If you if you lived in East Cleveland, you had money, because this is where Rockefeller settled, right. and the first uh, gas station is still in East Cleveland. The, the, it's um, Standard Oil. First Standard Oil gas station. The building is still there. The gas station is not, but they're using it as a repair shop. That's on Lee Road. That's on Euclid. Uh, Lee and Euclid. Or pay or. Page and Wine yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the building. Yeah. Okay. That, and that's the first. Yeah. It used to be a gas station. Yeah. Okay. That was the first Standard Oil gas station in Cleveland because that's where Rockefeller driveway was Forest Hill. So you had to end with the gate at the Euclid. You're kidding. You had to come through that gate. Wow. He would take a private train to where Superior and Euclid Rapid is right now. Oh, yeah? And then they would pick him up in the limousine. And they would take him through the gate. Through the gate at, at Euclid and, and Forest Hill. Wow! So it would, it would go. It would go up past. That was there. his driveway. You're kidding. 
all up underneath that bridge. Uh huh. Okay. And then uh, you would go down Lee Road. And then where they have that assistant living, brand new assistant living nursing home. McGregor. McGregor, that used to be his mansion. Wow, I didn't know that either. That's where his mansion was. Ah, so you came through East Cleveland a lot back then. Huh? I mean, you knew your way around. Well, I know the history of him. But okay. when Rockefeller was here, that was in the early 1900s. I wasn't around. Okay. <laughs> I just know the history. Okay. But I used to come through East Cleveland uh, partying. You know, when I would leave, you know, we we'd go bar hopping. We'd leave 105 in Euclid. We'd go, go to Leo's Casino. We would go uh, Huff, wow. the Huff area. Wow. And one of the places we would go would be in the East Cleveland area, which was a lot, looked a lot better than they do now because, you know, these factories, all them factories, you see a lot of abandoned factories around East Cleveland. Yes. And they were all booming then. People yeah. was working. If you didn't want a job, if you didn't have a job, it's because you didn't want to work. And, you under, and, and, and women would have babies to stay on welfare. And the more babies they had, the more money they got. Okay. Okay. So they'd keep the money, and the man would pay the rent, which was very little because they was on welfare. And uh, it worked out. He didn't have to marry her, but you know, he would stay there. And uh, he paid the rent. He would, he, would, he would benefit from the government. He had a good job, so he paid little rent for the whole family. Yeah, be popping out kids. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I know you talked about bar hopping in East Cleveland through 105, but but back in that day, what would you say would be some of your fondest memories of East Cleveland specifically? Of East Cleveland? Yes. Stores and factories and money flowing, and nobody standing on the corner selling drugs. And you might see some working ladies. But it wasn't, they wasn't selling drugs. They wasn't selling. They wasn't. They went out there for 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 drugs. They was, you know, you, it was a legitimate pimp and hole business. You know. And back then, people lived in those houses and those Yeah, apartments. yeah, yeah. Pimping. That was, uh, uh, you know, Cadillac, Lincoln. You know, uh -huh. nice clothes, nice looking women. You know, and this is what the young younger guys looked up to. You know. We had a, a interview the other day, and the guy told us that uh, the movie was actually made after a guy in Cleveland, mm -hmm. uh, the Mac. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the guy was from Cleveland, but the movie was was made after a guy in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So you're speaking of that era. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You were around then. Yeah, I'm 63. What was that era like? Oh, that was that was kind of exciting, you know. You, yeah. You see, the, the, and I, I, I befriended a lot of, uh, a couple guys, you know, two, three guys that, that called themselves pimping. And I met women, you know, and I, I had a 50, 50, 50 business deal with a couple of women. That, you know, I would pull the tricks out of Ford Plant, guys, the hillbillies from West Virginia, they, 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 they go home and see their woman dressed up in a, a curler that they had. They wanted some different kind. I would, I would supply them with my two cousins. Uh, I called them my two cousins. Right. They showed me a good time. I said, now you, I'm going to have to pay them, but you don't give them no money. You give it to me. And I would split it, 50-50. Okay. They didn't have, the women took care of them because no money hit their hand. They didn't have to worry about the women running out on them or nothing. They paid me. When, they, when the women took care of them and, they was, and they, everything was all right, they could leave and I would deal with the money. I would split the money. But I'd also be there to watch them, the clients. But I had a little safety net because they worked at Ford with me. Wait, no. No, see, they trusted me. <laughs> they trusted me, I trusted them. So it worked out there. Okay. But usually uh, a, a guy would get two holes in a sissy punk. You know, he started his hip hip and hole business. <laughs> sissy punk watched the hoes. Uh -huh. <laughs> sissy punk watched the hoes. Uh, yeah, yeah, because he, he didn't have to worry about them messing with the women. But anything they did, they went, that he didn't like, the sissy punk would tell him. Uh, and he paid the sissy punk. Got you. <coughs> okay. We'll move on to the next one. In what ways has the city of East Cleveland changed over time? Through the economics, through the plants closing, the jobs falling, the houses being in ill repair, being abandoned, 
People had to give up their houses. People had to move out of the apartment buildings. And then the flow of crack cocaine took, every, took East Cleveland uh, took East Cleveland down as far as it's been. And, th and that was leading into my next question. What do you think contributed to those changes? Now, would you say crack cocaine, or would you say drugs in general, or was it specific? crack cocaine? Crack, crack cocaine, cocaine introduced everybody. Now that came because it made cocaine cheap. Before, blacks just smoked weed because cocaine cost too much because you had to buy it in the powder. And then you had to you had to you had to freebase it and you had to cook it up into a, a crystal to smoke it. They never smoked it. They would always buy it in powder and sniff it. And it would cost like, a, you would only buy it at $100. You had to spend 50 to to $100 at a time. Man. Yeah, to get it by powder, you couldn't buy it on 10 cent worth of powder. It wouldn't even be worth it. It would melt in the paper. Okay. Nobody would go through the trouble of wrapping up $10 worth of powder. You know. So when they introduced crack cocaine, they were able to sell a dime, a nickel, 20 cent. So it made it easier for you to get a hold of it, but then that would only last them an hour, hour and a half, if it lasted that long. A dime, would, 10 cent, would, I think, would last for a half hour, if it lasted that long. If it was good enough, if it, if it, if it wasn't mixed up with a lot of speed, you know. So that they would mix it with speed and make it last a little longer, they'd be, but they'd be speeding trying to get some more. Because they want that feeling they got from the first hit, and they never could get it again. And they have to come down and have to get it out of their system in order to get that first hit feeling again. They have to have, some of it would have to come out of their system before they get that first hit. You know. Wow. Okay, so we got economics. We got the jobs, companies leaving, led to people leaving houses, and then you had the whole crack epidemic. Mm -hmm. and, and approximately what year was that? 80s. The 80s? Yeah. Wow, that sounds like a, a heck of a time, especially coming in after all. And then the apartment buildings, they, they had to leave the apartment buildings because the drug dealers took over their apartment buildings. So the apartment buildings went down. They, they foreclosed the apartment, but they had to take over the government. And when they, when they busted the drug dealers and the drugs in the apartment, they, 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 the person lost the apartment building. Mm -hmm. That's a big impact. Yeah, and then, and then, and then, then they just left the apartment buildings to decay. And then at uh, Page and Weinboy is a prime example. All those apartment buildings were, were being re run by drug dealers. And too, so much drugs in there, they just start closing down. They bust the drug dealers, they bust the building, and the buildings just start to decay. And all, all the whole street was nothing but apartment buildings, you know. And then the houses around there, people was renting the houses, and they was getting taken away from them because they had a lot to do with drugs. So. Brought down the property and it brought down the street. Mm -hmm. Then they had crooked cops too. When you have that, when you have drug money, you're going to have crooked cops. So they busted a lot of crooked cops in East, Cleveland. In East Cleveland. Yeah, and he had crooked mayor from from Africa. <laughs> I don't heard, know if you remember him. Yeah. Heard about that guy? Yeah. That came up on one of our Yeah, cases. and then after he left, the next mayor came in, and he wasn't so much crooked. He was just happy all the time. He, well, you might say gay. <laughs> <laughs> but I started coming to Cleveland uh, back and forth from Oberlin during, in 66. Okay. I was going to Caramel House where I met Ron, Ron O'Neill and um, another actor came from Caramel House. And I um, studied drama at Caramel House. I did stand-up comedy on the weekends. So ever since I was 17, I've done stand-up comedy on the side. I haven't had a gig in a while because I have lost a lot of contacts. Because I was working seven days of work as a, as a week as a home health care. But I did a few shows for some of the bus drivers, you know, and getting on and off the buses and, tell it, and making them laugh, because you know, I broke the monotony. When I get on the bus, I, I, I always had some to break the monotony and make them smile and laugh. So I did some parties for them. You know. Do you do any stand up in any like uh, facility, no, like no, bars? No, no. Like I don't. I don't have the contacts for bars. I used to have contacts for bars, but 
I'd rather do par private parties and cabarets because it's a little bit more intimate. Bars and uh, bars and clubs, uh, you don't you don't get the attention and you don't know and they have such a mix of audience. You know what kind of audience you have. You can prepare your your uh, you can prepare your your spot and what you're going to do because you know the audience. You know it's going to be over a fifty, over a forty year old audience. You know it's going to be under. You know you know your audience better. You, in a club. Do any, did you ever do any uh, stand up or any acting in East Cleveland? At the Cleveland East Cleveland Theater? No, no, no. I, I saw that several times, you know, but I never got involved with that. No, okay. I was too busy working. Uh -huh. Didn't really have time. Okay. Yeah, but I saw. I always wanted to get involved. I I, I went there a couple of times, but they seemed like it was always closed. <laughs> never could get. I never found anybody in there. Yeah. You took the acting class over at the Caribbean House. Yeah, that was back when I was 17 years old. Though that was okay. a bit long. That's that's good. That's uh -huh. real good. Okay. Let's move on. Our next one, how has race and racism impacted you personally? Well, I, um, I went on a traveling spur at the age of 17 in the summer of 66. And I traveled New York, and Memphis, stayed in Ripley, Mississippi for about a month. And I went to uh, Texas. I went to uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I worked with Stokely Carmichael's group, SNCC, Student Non Coordinating Committee, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I worked beside Julian Bond and his wife. I met Martin Luther King. I went to his church. I heard his sermon, shook his hand. I marched across the Ebbett Bridge with Martin Luther King the second time. <laughs> They went across. The first time they got trampled. And I did all these things with a guy, Oberlin College student. You know, Oberlin College is surrounding Oberlin. And it's consumed. It was the first college to admit blacks. Private college, yeah. First college to have co education, women and men. It's rated with Yale and Princeton, Case. Any college with any, anybody in any college to know about Oberlin College. Wow. Oberlin Conservatory is rated, rated very high. And uh, anyway, they, as a project, the white students from Oberlin College went down to Mississippi in the summer of 65 and rebuilt a church that was burnt from the Ku Klux Klan. And they befriended a young man down there named Colin, Wilbur Colin. And they brought him back and supported him in the high school in Oakland. He was a failing student in Mississippi. Well, he pulled his grades up to, up to straight A's. Wow. Okay. And he went to Howard University. And he got married, and he went back and became a judge. He's a judge in Mississippi now, probably retired judge for now. Okay. And uh, his wife and him both own a Lincoln dealership. But yeah, but I went with him when he came, went back home that summer. They, they brought him up that next year and they supported him. He lived with a, a elementary school principal. They, they funded all his support. And then when he went back to Mississippi to see his parents, I went back with him because I had befriended him in high school. And uh, we went to New York first, then we went to then we, then we got together. He hitchhiked, and I caught the bus, and we met up in New York with some of the Oberlin College people that he knew from Oberlin College. He said, when in the summertime came, they went back home, so he knew them. Okay. He knew them, so he went to some of the places. We went to the places that they were at. And uh, we stayed in New York for about two weeks, and we came. Then we went to Mississippi, and it just so happens they, re they built a, a swimming pool in the black neighborhood that following year because the white college students took some of the black people from the town to the white swimming pool. In Mississippi. Yeah, and they couldn't do anything about it because those are white college students, the Oberlin college students, they didn't want to make a name hurting, you know, doing anything, you know, they didn't want to get on the map right. as, as, as doing anything to the white college students. Well, he told me when, I, when, when you go to Mississippi, tell them you went to Oberlin College as a protection thing. 
I said, well, what did I tell him I majored? And tell him you majored in physics. Ain't nobody asked you no questions. <laughs> so, uh, so we, we stayed down there for a month. He, he, uh, he cleaned out the basement of his father's store. He ran his father's little corner store. He cleaned the basement out, made it into a pool room. So in the, in the daytime, he ran his father's store, and in the, after, in the evening time, he ran the pool room underneath. I was a lifeguard because after they built that pool in the black neighborhood, they didn't realize no black people knew how to swim, and the ones that did learned in the creek. So in order to have a, a swimming pool operated and be, have insurance on it, you had to have a licensed lifeguard, which I got my licensed lifeguard at the age of 16 at Crane Pool in Oberlin College. See, we were able to, as living in that town, we were able to take advantage of a lot of the things that Oberlin College had to offer at that time. Later on in the 80s and 90s, they had shootings, and the townspeople messed up that deal. So they, they don't allow them in there. But, uh, so I was able to dictate any price I wanted as far as my salary, because without, with, without a licensed lifeguard, they couldn't open the pool, and they were losing money. So they opened the pool. I took $150 a week, which is in 66, was more than what I made at Ford Plant when I started at Ford Plant in 67. <laughs> See, I cleared it more than I cleared, you know. So I started, I started classes because everybody was in the shallow end. So I started classes, which made more money for the pool, and everybody was happy till one day, when it was raining, it started raining, and I was on my way home. I always stopped at this ice cream place and buy ice cream on my way home. This time I went inside because it was raining, and I didn't realize that was a restaurant inside, and a lot of black folks in there. And I'm coming from Oberlin, Oberlin, Ohio. Where you can go anywhere, you know, man. What color you were, you know? I ain't know nothing about, you know. So my friend came up to get me, but not before the mayor came and fired me for not being at work, even well, though it was raining. Even out though it was raining. And because I was from Oberlin College, it was the only reason I didn't get lynched. Wow. <laughs> so we left. His father said, "You're going to have to leave. They're going to fire me because his father drove the truck for Tipper Wholesale, which he got his groceries and everything very cheap at his little store." By driving that truck, he got his groceries real cheap. He said, I'll get fired, they'll burn my store down. They might not do nothing to you, but they'll get at me. That's the way they did. So we left and we went to Atlanta, Georgia. We went to Ripley, Mississippi. We went to uh, Memphis. We stayed there a while, then we flew from Memphis on a student rate. At that time, you get half fare student rate, which we flew from Memphis to Atlanta, Georgia for $16 a piece. And then we got connected with Stokely Carmichael's group. We stayed in a dormitory-like place called on Houston Street. We called it Houston Street because that's where the house was big. Everybody had a room and we would rotate shifts and we'd go down, we'd get in the van, we'd go downtown, we'd work at the office making Black Panther pamphlets. <laughs> wow. Yeah, don't, don't think that Stokely Carmichael and Rat Brown wasn't close. And Julian Bond is where he started his career. Okay. okay. And, uh, and uh, of course, Martin Luther King's church was there. Yeah. We went there. I went to his church, and there was uh, for for an hour and a half, you could hear a pin drop. He had everybody's attention for an hour and a half straight. Nobody. Martin Luther King. Yeah. Well, you know, it was a great order. Absolutely. And after the service, I was able to shake his hand. And I never knew at that time that he would be as famous as he is now. Of course. And then they had the march. I went on the second march. I'm glad I wasn't on the first. Oh, absolutely. And so I met a lot of people, and I came back to Oberlin at the end of the summer. And my parents didn't know where I was from one day to another. No, no phones and stuff. They like had no that cell phones then. Wow. wow. <laughs> I'm going to readjust yeah. this. So it was over in 69, I quit Oberlin uh, Community College because I was making more than my professor and I had better benefits. So I worked at Ford Motor Company 23 years before I got hurt and went on compensation. Wow. I had a business in Ford. Uh -huh. uh, I, I booked numbers, I uh, cashed checks, loaned money, and I sold pop. Hot dogs. I sold 200 pops and 150 hot sausages a day. Ford. Ford Motor Company. I bring my stuff in as far as from Euclid to my house. I would have to bring it in the truck gate 
on a dolly. Three great big coolers and two small coolers on top of it with my crock pots in it. Wow, wow. That's good stuff. I, I wanted to clear it, get a little more information on the traveling. All these places you went in one summer? One summer. Wow. About 13 cities. 13 cities. We worked our way around. On the bus? As well, no, on the student. bus, planes. I went on the bus to New York. He hitchhiked. The rest of it was plain because they had half fare rate. So we worked our way around. He was in New York. We made money because he was a pool shark. So we used to set up where I would beat him and get other people to play him. And when the money got big, that's when he would win. Okay. okay. They would bet on me. And they was making money betting on me until the money got up to double or nothing, double or nothing, then he would beat me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, then we I'm left New York. We walked across the George Washington Bridge with a white girl that was from Oberlin College. We went down into Harlem and they wouldn't serve us because we had that white girl. We had people walk, running around, waving things, black power. Very dangerous. I had a very dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I could have been dead a long time ago and, or in prison. <laughs> uh, but uh, God was on my side. What kind of impact did the incident in Mississippi have on you, which you were a lifeguard. You said you yeah. went to an ice cream store. Yeah, I went into a place that I bought ice cream on the outside. Yeah, but you actually went in. The yeah, store. then then I realized with Jim Crow, then I learned about Jim Crow. That had to be devastating. Yeah. That had to be devastating. So you've had various race and racism, and it has impacted Dis you. Just discriminate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how would you feel race and racism has impacted the city of East Cleveland? Well, uh, you know, look around, there's not that many white people live there. White people moved out, black people and crack moved in, crack shut down, caused a lot of build, uh, apartment buildings and houses to be, to be closed up. Uh, all kinds, you know, crack was the main leader, but they ain't been selling every kind of drug. You wanted heroin. Whatever kind of drug you want, you can find it in East Cleveland. Wow, wow, okay. How about inequality? How would you say inequality has impacted you and then inequality impacted the city of East Cleveland? Quality hasn't impacted the city of East Cleveland yet, as far as I'm concerned. Inequality? I haven't seen any kind of quality. Inequality? No, I haven't seen any. Anything that was that had to do with quality, I haven't seen it impact the city of East Cleveland. Quality won't be there till they till they till they get rid of the drugs. You don't see people stand on the corner and shake heights. No. <laughs> yeah, they want something. They go. They know where they go to East Cleveland. Okay. So until they start until they start getting rid of the houses and get rid of the abandoned houses and people start going to work and they start uh, uh, starving the drug dealers. They got to starve them. So they can't, can't give them the customers. If they don't have the customers, they can't sell them. Okay. Okay. They don't have no customers in, in Shaker Heights unless they come to East Cleveland to buy it. Okay. <laughs> now you talked about a little about inequality in the incident in New York in which you had the, the white girl and then people were mad with you. Well, I wouldn't, we went into a restaurant. They wasn't service. We had a white girl. It was during, it was during the 60s, during the, 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 the red hot time. Have you ever experienced anything like that in Cleveland? I was in, I was in Detroit, okay. and I was, uh, I was watching them looting a store on, on Grand Avenue, Lindsay's grocery store. And uh, while I was watching them, a National Guard stuck a gun to the side of my head and told me to move. They were getting people off of the street. And they arrested me for, for entering without breaking. Trumped up charge. When they declare martial law, you don't have any constitutional rights. Is that what that was, martial yeah. law? Yeah. So I was put in a precinct garage. And we slept on the cement floor near a drain where everybody urinated. Wow. wow. I had water running in the corner. And soldiers giving us a sandwich, bologna sandwich and coffee twice a day with their bare hands. Coffee tastes like mud, 
And you didn't and if you saw some black marks on the white bread, you did not care. You ate, you ate it. it. Wow. Now was this with some more of your Oberlin buddies or No, this is well, a person that was with me that was from Oberlin. What happened, his brother was we were all in Oberlin. His brother was in Oberlin because his one of his older brothers died in Vietnam and they were, he came to the funeral. That's when the riot broke out in Detroit. Okay. okay. And he went back. And I how he got into Detroit with a black paneled van, I don't know, during the riots. I mean, the man knew the back roads. And we were just watching, we watched, we watched, we went to the, down on 12th and Pingree, we saw pimps in their robes and their cars and their top down. And the lady standing beside his car with a shotgun, the other ladies were getting televisions out of the store, looting. So it was exciting for a young 17, 18 year old boy, you know. Wow. 68. Yeah. Okay, okay. Can you recollect a memory or an instance when the community of East Cleveland or Cleveland, particularly East Cleveland, fought for something, when they all stood up for something? At one time they were going in groups, walking down streets that were people that were dealing, they were, the drugs were being dealt. And they would go like in maybe a groups of 20 and 30 singing religious songs. And, and, and walking up and down those streets, disrupting any kind of sale. So they were trying that at one time, community, trying to take back the streets type thing. I don't know if they're doing it now. Oh, so, what year was this? This was in uh, early 90s, early to the middle 90s. Take back the drug streets? Yeah. Did, did, was that successful at all? or? For a while, and then they they tired of it. And yeah. You ever partake in any of that? No, I used to watch them. I was too busy working. I used to stand there walking. Or I'd be standing waiting on the bus or getting off the bus, and I'd see them. You know, right. the groups. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How have the surrounding institutions and cities impacted the city of East Cleveland, or not impacted the city of East Cleveland, like Cleveland Heights, or Cleveland, or University Circle? University Circle Hospital. You know, I don't know. I don't know how how they have impacted. I can't really say okay. how how they have impacted East Cleveland. I know that they they kind of like separate themselves from East Cleveland as much uh -huh. as they can. They cooperate as far as law. You know, as far as law enforcement, they cooperate pretty good with one another. Okay. But I don't think they have really impacted. I think East Cleveland is trying to come up to their standards. You know, with all the different. All these different cameras, stuff like that, trying to get money. You think that over, over the years, like say from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and the 2000s, that these surrounding cities have helped East Cleveland or kind of turned their back on East Cleveland? Because a lot of these cities have built up their own cities. Right. Uh, East Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Heights and all the cities around East Cleveland uh, are benefited from the people leaving East Cleveland. Factories, jobs, and anybody who had nice homes in East Cleveland sold them so they could go to Cleveland Heights. Shaker. Okay. Good deal. Okay. What is your vision for the future of East Cleveland? What would you like East Cleveland to look like? Well, I, w I would like East Cleveland to clean up the, the, the abandoned houses and abandoned apartment buildings and build new apartment buildings and buy low and, and build low income housing for people that didn't have very much money but wanted pride, they had pride where they lived. So they would keep the other people's houses, the value of them up. They would make sure their lawns were taken care of. They wouldn't, they wouldn't throw trash in the street. You know, and uh, they would keep up because they have an incentive. East Cleveland has to give the people of East Cleveland, the poor people of East Cleveland, incentive to keep their property up, to want to work, to be a, has to give businesses incentive to, 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 uh, to bring businesses in, and they have to give an incentive 
to rebuild apartment buildings and houses, affordable houses like they're doing in the Huff neighborhood, you know, like they're doing in, in uh, the neighborhoods around, in the, around Community College, you know. That's on uh, the Woodland? Woodland and, and, yes. and, and Cedar. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. I saw those, those are really nice. Now, it's yeah. hard to believe those were the projects. Well, you see they're coming up Euclid. I don't know if those condos or okay. they're by Lakeview. Okay, right, right. But they're going to stop at a certain point. Certainly won't go past Windermere. So. Why do you think that is? Well, nobody wants to live past Windermere. <laughs> <laughs> the people that are going to—they're building those apartments and those condos for people to save gas, and they save parking. They jump on the health line and they're downtown. They can take the green bus anywhere they want to go. And, and they, not, they can walk. Right. That saves on parking, traffic, and gas. Okay. They work downtown. The health line runs every five minutes yep. during certain hours. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah, so that's, that's why they put so much money in that health line. That, that they have. To bring people downtown to the vents. Okay. Mm -hmm. And right now we're talking about the future of East Cleveland. Do you, can you tell me about the major issues that need there, addressing? I, I heard that they're going to be moving the police station to, you think that's a good idea? to the outer East Cleveland. Well, City Hall a new building. A City Hall, I imagine. Build, a new building. A new building would be good. But I don't know if that would help. I, I might improve it by moving it away. So businesses can go down through there and they can have businesses. And, and, and by having neighborhood, having the neighborhood, uh, giving the power to the neighborhoods to clean up their incentives for the neighborhoods to clean up their own neighborhoods. Okay. They're starting to, I notice that they don't see the different corners that they used to hang out when I'm on the bus. I don't see them out in the, on those different corners like I used to. Matter of fact, they ought to pay people. To make buys <laughs> that local, the drug dealers that the drug dealers trust uh -huh. the crackheads people pay them, Set them up. what they're doing and put them under pressure I mean they catch them with a little bit of cocaine or a stem or something they pressure them to make a buy you know to get them off you know I can get you you know this this will go away if you if you make a buy you know to pressure them that way but in Washington DC I understand that they they actually paying them 50 bucks and letting, okay. them keep, and letting them keep the product. They don't need the product after they bust them with all theirs. Wow, wow. Okay, well, you, you, you listed a couple of, of issues that need addressing. The low income, the incentives, new houses, new businesses, clean up the streets. Mm -hmm. Are there any other issues that you think need addressing inside the city? I know earlier you talked mm -hmm. about the... The churches, should, the churches should unite and, and unite with programs to get younger the younger class people because churches just won't survive if the younger people don't start taking over if they're not equipped to take over you know the older people in the church will just die off and the church will disappear so the churches have to have to unite with programs and money instead of trying to get all the money for their church they have a certain amount of money to take this money and put it together so they can have programs to, to give younger people the incentive to want to go to church and to church programs and get involved in church and recognize that they don't do anything by themselves. It's all, everything is done through God. Until the people start getting conscious, God conscious. And right now, uh, people, everybody tries to do things on their own. They don't realize they don't do nothing on their own. Well, no, okay. I never, I never went to any of the churches in East Cleveland. Okay. I would go to the churches, they gave out free meals, you know, uh, that one church over by the library, I went to that. Yeah. That's the church I grew up in. Yeah. Definitely. They give out free meals, I went there a couple of times, but never went to the services.
So I got you down. I got you down for helping East Cleveland for the future. New businesses, new houses. They have to have incentives. Incentives. Incentives for all that to happen. They have to provide incentives for those things to happen. What would you think would be some of those incentives? Like, give me an idea. Well, ch uh, programs for younger people, okay? Just through the churches? <laughs> through the churches and churches connect with the city. Something for the younger kids, younger people to do. And incorporate it with the city and the churches. The schools, uh, the schools should be involved too. You know, they, the schools should have programs too. Uh, there was a couple, a couple years ago, uh, Shaw High School had sixty percent of the kids had HIV. Sixty percent. Sixty percent. It never hit the newspaper. <laughs> wow. I found out from somebody whose kid went there. 60%? Sixty percent of the kids in, in Shaw High School was was having uh, having sexual related diseases. Wow, we're talking uh, teenagers. Yeah. Mm. They they they. As a matter of fact, they uh, had some on camera in the locker rooms or something in a different place having sex. Yeah. Hey, kid, I don't know. That's they were having sex in the school. That's terrible. That's terrible. Listen, Michael. We're winding down here on the questions. And our next question is, what would you do, what would you be prepared to do to help East Cleveland get better? To make some of these changes. What would I be prepared to do? Get involved and, and, and try to get involved in programs that would uh, interest people, other people, to get involved. Give incentives for other people to get in, to want to get involved. You can't do nothing by yourself. You have to have the people's cooperation. Okay. And you have to get other people involved to put the incentives out there, and have them go to city hall, have them and have them go to the churches, and until you can see city hall and the churches and the schools uniting in the same ideas. For the younger people, East Cleveland is going to fade away, and some other city is going to just take over there. Because once the older people die off, move out, younger people won't have the skills or the know-how, or the jobs, or the money, or the connections to hold it together. So you think another city would take it over? Have to, have to. If there was nothing there. Who's going to pay the police? Here on hospital's gone. Stephanie Tubbs Jones Outpatient Center is a, is a marvelous place. It's, it, and I've gotten better service through that than I have through the hospital. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, listen, Michael, is there any other remarks, any other things you'd like to tell the East Cleveland and Case Western Reserve here on your oral life narrative? No, I just about covered just about everything. Yeah, and the only that's the main thing. They have to get the younger people involved. If the younger people are not involved, it was East Cleveland will just fade away. Okay. How do you feel about our government? I know you made a couple of remarks about past government and past mayors. Oh, I think the government is uh, in the bed with uh, with Mitt Romney. Right now? Well, he. I oh, think he's he's oh, under the government. I meant East Cleveland government. Oh, I, I think East Cleveland government is trying to bring money into East Cleveland. They're trying to get money through all these cameras and lights and stuff, but they're bleeding. They're bleeding the same people that they're, that they're trying to help. Yeah, I can't, you can't draw blood out in one way, put blood in the other way, you know. That's a hard call, but you like to administrate. You give mayor I think the mayor, the mayor they have now is better than the mayor they had before. Mm -hmm. are outside of East Cleveland, are mm -hmm. people who don't live in the city. Right. So, that's 
that, that's not a bad trade-off. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Okay, Michael, we'd like to thank you for your time. But then as a result of that, people are going to stop coming to East Cleveland. And they're not going to be spending their money in East Cleveland, so they got to pay those traffic fines. They don't realize that either. That's a drawback, yeah. That means, the 80, that means people are coming from other parts of the city, and it's going to stop. I know people now that won't drive up Euclid. Same here. Same here. I know people that won't, won't come to East Cleveland because of that. Yeah. Yeah. So you got trade-offs. So your businesses are losing business because of the cameras. Okay. People that used to come to the business will come to the business no more. People that used to come to people's homes, they take, try to take the back routes, and they don't come on the main streets where the businesses are at. Right. 